and this also overlaps, I think, with the hardest part, which is really to make sure uh, you have enough content that you're confident of the relevance, but um, yeah, without sort of uh, overdoing and being in a chapter forever. So I think yeah. this is the hardest part for sure. This is a conversation with Dr. Catherine Altobelli, who is an Italian lawyer with an academic background from the Netherlands and the UK, who was so kind to decide uh, to move to Vienna and to work at the University of Vienna for several years, and during this period to write a PhD thesis on the interplay between data protection law and intellectual property law. It's a really uh, groundbreaking thesis. I'm very proud of being the supervisor of this, and I'm very happy to share with you some of her experiences on the writing process. Enjoy. Catherine, so nice to have you here. Uh, such a pleasure after a rather long journey uh, that started some years ago with you starting as a student assistant at our department with a very international background, your bachelor uh, in the Netherlands, your master in the UK. Why did you come to Vienna? Um, so yeah, thank you so much, first of all, Nicholas, for having me. Um, why did I come to Vienna? Yeah, I wish there was a lot of rationality behind every decision. Um, I would say the department, so of innovation mm. and digitalization was the perfect fit after mm. sort of studying European law and then focusing on innovation technology and law in Edinburgh. So it was just a, a mm. great fit, I would say. And obviously the city was also very attractive to me. So here yeah. I am still here. So it seems like it was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, and you, you decided to stay here despite of the fact that you no longer work at the university. Yeah, so that's correct. Means, so the yeah. city is, is a good choice in a yeah, way. Yeah, right? the city yeah. is really nice. Yeah. And um, it has been a great home as well for the last, yeah, four years and a half already yeah quite some time yeah. yeah and why did you decide to write a PhD um well it just like it was a call to be mm -hmm. honest so mm -hmm. in the sense um I was very fascinated by the topics and I was curious about dealing with um a theoretical topic as uh, in depth as possible mm -hmm. so the PhD was for me just uh, a natural let's say, uh, follow up to the studies I had uh, at the master level. And I think with IT law, as it's something that it's not really touched upon at bachelor level, and you sort of go almost on a superficial level still um, mm. in the master's, I think to have a deep understanding, the PhD is a perfect fit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the key arguments people make why it's worth writing mm -hmm. a PhD that you really dig deeply into a problem and that you have two or three years of time invested into one specific issue and then hopefully you really understand what this is about. But on the other hand, it's just about one single problem in a way and there are so many others out there. Do you still think that it's worth it or would you recommend if, if you were five years younger now, would you recommend to do it differently and instead of writing a PhD, just, you know, do another master or go to abroad somewhere instead of this, instead of really focusing on one topic? Um, I feel as if obviously the PhD is not the only way to gather yeah. those skills and knowledge, um, but the learning curve is steep. And I think that's mm -hmm. what is important or was important for me after the master's. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond the content. I think building a project like that, defining the steps and making sure you can, you know, combine that with other tasks. So mm -hmm. I was a university assistant, which involves teaching, involves dealing with European projects and so on. So I think all those aspects put together just make it a really great job after, you know, mm -hmm. studies basically. Yeah, but you decided, at least for the moment, to leave academia and to go into practical work. Do, do you still think that it's worth doing it also in cases in which you de don't end up as a professor or don't plan to end up as a professor? Um, yes, at least yeah. for, for sort of for my career, it was a really crucial step. Mm -hmm. I think uh, deciding to go for a PhD is a deeply personal choice in the sense that it really depends on um, what sh what your call is. And for me, the mm. PhD itself taught me so much um, and so many aspects of it are relevant every day at my current job, mm -hmm. uh, even content wise in this case. But um, mm -hmm. I think it, why not? You know, yeah. um, I'm sure there are so many other paths that can uh, bring you to similar outcomes and also I still have some parts that I need to strengthen that mm -hmm. were not part of my academic um, work but mm -hmm. on the other hand 
um, I don't see the PhD exclusively as a sort of step towards academia. Yeah. yeah. So you were already mentioning that some parts of the content are also relevant to you at the moment in what you're doing now, which which triggers two questions. <laughs> First, what was the content? Second, why is this relevant to your work at the moment? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so the content of the PhD was the interplay of copyright and data protection, focusing mm -hmm. on data subject rights, in particular, the right of access and the right to data portability in the GDPR and how these should be balanced in relation to copyright interests. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why this is relevant, so I'm currently a product manager in data protection and I deal a lot with data subject rights, mm -hmm. um, more from a sort of high level perspective, so not really following up and responding to requests, mm -hmm. but um, the fundamental questions of how to deal with different interests when mm -hmm. trying to comply with data protection um, is really relevant and I think it's a, it was a practical PhD to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So uh, what stem, stems out of that, um, I think, thesis is still very relevant in a day-to-day -day business perspective. Yeah, but it's also very relevant, in my view, from an academic perspective, because one of my learnings in, in, in reading and, and, and trying to, to understand what you are doing uh, of your work was that it's really stunning that such a fundamental question, such as if someone, a data subject on the one hand, tries to use his uh, personal rights coming out of GDPR on the one hand, and this is on the other hand then in conflict with another person's fundamental rights coming out of IP protection, that such a fundamental question is so, so poorly analyzed so far in the existing literature. So it was really in a way groundbreaking, although it's in my view at least one of the most obvious questions uh, that might appear, right? Uh, and and I I when I when I saw you writing this um, and and fighting through this uh, I I was I was sometimes feeling sorry for you because it it's so groundbreaking and on the other hand it's so fundamental right and so simple in a way. Uh, how did you find this topic? Um. Hmm, that's a good question. So the simple reason uh, is probably that I really liked copyright law and I really mm. liked data protection. So <laughs> I kind of, um, yeah, was looking for a bridge. And mm -hmm. um, I think starting from the concept of data from a very academic and abstract point of view and trying to narrow it to the more practical and day-to-day -day issue of really implementing these rights, right, that everyone has, I sort of found this place where information was this odd object that was stretched mm. between two legal fields that weren't really talking to each other. Mm. And I think that answers to a certain extent your question, yeah. um, that not so many people are willing in academia, but also in policy making and so on, to talk about data protection and IP law side by side. Mm. Um, yeah, there is a gap, just I think of expertise there. Mm. Um, so I think that there's a very sort of uh, simple reason why there there was a research gap when I defined the, the question, right? Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And I find this really stunning because there is such th th this huge group of GDPR people and, and academics working in data protection. And there's this, this huge group of IP people working on intellectual property in particular. And, and they hardly ever communicate with each other, despite of the fact that, that both of them need to deal with data and data comes with personal protection in both sides in both directions it's it's really strange and i when i was reading your thesis one of the questions i always had was whether it whether we need to reorganize how how we treat these things academically right so whether whether we need some kind of super competence which is data as a topic and then no matter whether it's ip or gpr or whatever uh uh, artificial intelligence or blockchain or whatever. But that's very difficult, right? Because it's already very difficult to make this a discipline, an academic discipline as it stands at the moment. And I, I really I really appreciated your your attempt and also your successful bridging between those two two areas that don't talk too much to each other. But when it comes to people helping you in writing this or supervising it or assessing it, did you did you have the feeling that people were willing to cross that bridge or cross that border, or was it still that everyone stayed within their comfort zone and 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 left the other part to people <laughs> from the other side? 
Um, well, I think it's not a coincidence that you were also the supervisor. So mm -hmm. I remember, um, so I came to Vienna with the topic, mm -hmm. not fully defined, but like on a high level. And mm -hmm. I remember you, you have expertise in both data protection mm -hmm. and copyright. And this was a core selling point for the department. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not so easy to mm -hmm. find those academics. And um, in defining the topic, it's very hard uh, yeah, to just mm -hmm. find professors um, that have that expertise that they are comfortable throughout the topics I'm touching upon in the PhD. Um, so I wouldn't say there is resistance, but um, I think whenever a very experienced person, you know, is being exposed to something they're not experts in, there there is some yeah. reluctancy inevitably. Yeah, and, and would you have any recommendations for people who are in the same situation at the moment, how to deal with this? So how to find other people, more senior people who might be willing to, to leave their own, own comfort zone? Is it, is it the right approach to write emails to them? Is it the right approach to go to conferences? Is it the right approach to ask your supervisor to bring you in touch? Or is it better to simply do, not doing anything and just doing the work and mm. then... I think trying to explain uh, the sort of why behind what you're researching helps because if there's relevance, uh, I mm. positively say that people tend to uh, meet your needs and um, without sort of maybe requesting to check, you know, details of the law of the mm. field that they're not experts in, feedback is still great. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, I think once you're a legal professional, you can apply that knowledge and that mm. mentality to different fields. Um, mm. So definitely, yeah, if there's a tip, have the confidence and try to explain what you're doing also to um, other people that don't know everything about the topic you're writing about. Because in any case, a good PhD shouldn't be right all known in so. Yeah. Are there any other tips that you would be willing to share with people in a similar situation? So about, I don't know, time management, when to speak to your supervisor, whether or not to go to other uh, universities, whether or not to attend lectures and so on. What What is your personal learning here? So um, I think there are a lot of tips out there um, that are helpful, such as... Uh, you know, write small portions at a time. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's important to find the most uh, productive way for you, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, so for me, it is still making sure I cut sufficient time to go in depth mm -hmm. if I look at the writing part. Um, so yeah, really try to personalize the tips in the sense of um, writing a PhD in takes a lot of attention. So it's mm. very hard to jump into it for an hour per week. So for example, a simple tip, instead of working an hour per day, make sure a whole day is focused on the PhD. I think that can mm. really help to push the topic forward and see progress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the most important mistake that you made? Mm, that's a tricky question. Um, yeah, probably like, um, leaving like some periods of time not mm. regularly checking in on the work and yeah i think an issue with uh slight perfectionism is also to have the confidence of just let go and accept certain mm. parts um and and this also overlaps i think with the hardest part which is really to make sure uh you have enough content that you're confident of the relevance but um yeah, without sort of uh, overdoing and being in a chapter forever. So I think yeah. this is the hardest part for sure. Yeah. And as we said already, your background was not Austrian. So so you're, you're one of the rare cases, relatively rare cases of people really coming here for a PhD. Is there anything in the Austrian system you could not really adapt to or something you would warn about people who are similar to you? Um, I would say like, even in the years I've been at the University of Vienna, it has been easier and easier to mm. um, yeah, be a student and also work at the mm. university uh, without speaking German fluently um, and without being Austrian. Um, I would say the hardest part is still admin related, mm -hmm. um, really simple things, but such as recognizing degrees from abroad and so on. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is something that yeah, it's not just an Austrian issue. I'm sure mm. many other countries have similar hurdles. Um, 
but it's quite stressful, let's say, when mm. uh, some paperwork slows down, uh, years of work. Yeah. yeah, but when it comes to the academic part, mm -hmm. meaning yeah. so the role of the supervisor or, or the assessment or the grading or anything, was there anything which was completely weird for you or strange or something you think that people outside Austria would not expect to happen in that way? Um, nothing mm. particular, I would say. Yeah. Um, mm. Of course, like the whole idea of having, um, you know, oral exam, this is different. So yeah. I'm not thinking about the seminars where it's inevitable that you need to present your topic, um, but more um, this uh, philosophical exams or hermeneutics mm -hmm. at some point. So this, I think, was the first oral exam because <laughs> I think in the Netherlands and in the UK, there's mm -hmm. a tendency to prefer written yeah. exams. So that's uh, an interesting experience. Okay. But um, I think at the PhD level, it's also yeah. different than going through, you know, bachelor or master's with these yeah. type of exams. Yeah. So no clear warning here to anyone with a non austrian background that people should be aware <laughs> of something, right? Apart from... No, no I wouldn't yeah. say no okay. clear Apart warning. Apart from bureaucracy yeah. and, and oral exams, which, yeah. which not everyone is um, accustomed to. Yeah. So, um, you, uh, I mean, there is also an oral exam at the end, which is the disputation uh, or, or, or however you call it. So, the, it's the supervisor and two people um, who assess the work, um, who, who then wrote an opinion on it, who again challenge uh, the work. And I, I don't think that I break any data protection rules if I indicate that this went very well in your case. Um, so, so, the assessment was very, very positive. Which brings another question now, which is whether or not to publish this. Um, uh, my question to you would be, do you see any value in publishing uh, a PhD? If so, where should one publish? And if so, will you or will you not uh, go that path? Yeah, so maybe let's start from the last part of the yeah. question. So uh, it's in the pipeline. So mm. um, I mean, the process of really defining what's the best way for this type of research to be published. Yeah. Um, I see value simply in, yeah, also giving back to the academic community. Um, I think there were 2000 footnotes or so in my mm. PhD. Um, and I hope that the work I did can also help further research. So I think that's the very fundamental reason why it makes sense for it to be available uh, yeah. to other other researchers and students and so on. Yeah. So let's see whether you're... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finger crossed. This is, I, I cross my fingers and let's see whether it's going to be online or as a book. Um, that's also one of the questions you certainly will need to answer. Um, and also, the la perhaps one more thing about the language. You obviously wrote in English. Was mm -hmm. that a specific problem? Um, in, in Austria? I mean, in Austria, or... yeah, just in Austria. I wouldn't say so, no. Mm. It was uh, it was fine, yeah. absolutely. I didn't have a language issue at any point. So, so Okay, <laughs> happy to hear that. <laughs> so, please come to Austria, yeah. no problems. <laughs> well, let's see. Thank you so much, Catherine. I think I, 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 we, uh, you covered all the questions I had, um, and I thank you very much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>